Welcome to the OIS Podcast. Today, our host, Dr. Rob Rothman, chats with Yakov Miklin about the innovations his company, BioLite Life Sciences, is funding and how they fit within Israel's vibrant startup environment. BioLite is an ophthalmology VC fund with a well-curated portfolio of products designed to treat both front of the eye and back of the eye diseases. Take it away, Rob. Today's guest is Yaakov Michelin. Yaakov is the CEO of BioLite Life Sciences. He is also the co-chairman of the IATI, which we will talk about in a little bit. Um, and for those of you who don't know BioLite, it is a publicly traded venture capital fund focusing on ophthalmic assets based in Israel. So Yaakov, welcome to the podcast today, and thank you for taking the time. It's always fun with the uh, time difference scheduling these things, so I appreciate you uh, being here at a mutually agreeable time today. Thank you. Very happy to be here and participate in your podcast. Right? So, so Yaakov, I, you know, I've had the chance to meet you um, in a peripheral way initially. I think through diligence on some companies in the past, but um, you know, obviously, we've got to know each other, got to know each other a lot better over the um, past few years. And I think one of the things that's interesting for the audience is to hear a little bit about you. So first of all, you know, sort of explain your background, you know, who you are. I know this story, so I think it's interesting for the audience, but sort of tell people who you are, about where you grew up, your education, things like that, and how you ended up becoming the CEO of a publicly traded venture capital fund in ophthalmology, because the pathway is is very interesting. And I think it's important background for why your fund is so successful. So I'll try to surprise even you, Rob, and uh, get you some details that you didn't hear so far. So, okay. Uh, so uh, I was born in Moscow, actually. And uh, as many of the Israelis, we immigrated from various countries. So I uh, came with my parents to Israel when I was two years old, so I don't remember too much. Uh, yeah, I had a career in high school, like a uh, usual, you know, computer uh, geek and uh, in a very good uh, school, uh, learning uh, computer, software, hardware, and then the classical uh, service as an uh, officer in the 8200 unit in the intelligence force in Israel. Uh, but then I switched my career, I decided that I don't want to get to the high tech, I want to uh, study law and economics, uh, finished with the uh, cum laude. And then I, uh, as an external partner, I worked a lot with uh, Teva. In uh, Israel, Teva used to be the largest uh, pharmaceutical company in Israel, and one of the top in the world then. And it was exciting times. We did, we did a lot of acquisition in Israel, uh, we raised a lot of capital, the famous Popoxon, and it was, uh, the, it was really exciting times. When uh, Teva became focused more on the US market and less in Israel, I decided uh, to switch career to a management position, not being an advisor. Uh, I then uh, graduated in Cum uh, Laude with an MBA in managing uh, high tech companies from the Israeli MIT, the Technion. And I had the opportunity to, uh, my first job as, uh, in a management position was in Sue, it's the technology transfer company of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. During my time, it was one of the top 10 in the world. I was involved in creating uh, tens of uh, startup companies in the healthcare space. I also created there a VC investing in biotech and a VC investing in uh, agriculture. And there was exciting times, eight years, and I was also the, the chairman of the Israeli Organization for Tech Transfer. And then after a nice uh, eight years there, I decided that I want to have a more operative uh, role and the opportunity came uh, along and I joined a medical device company with real uh, revenues uh, with uh, 70 employees in, uh, in Israel. Uh, I joined this uh, company and I took a major part in expanding its uh, U.S. commercial team in Hackensack, New Jersey. We got to about uh, 30 employees then with uh, growing uh, revenues. Also, I had, uh, took the company, it was public on the Israeli Store Exchange, but then I took it public on the NASDAQ, which was a nice uh, IPO on the NASDAQ. And when it became a NASDAQ uh, publicly traded company, I decided uh, that I got the company to a nice uh, stage and I decided uh, to leave. And uh, I went to, to see the world a little bit, uh, trek around Anapurna in Nepal. And uh, uh, actually, 
doing the after army trip that usually the Israelis do. I did it in the age of 50. It was fun. Then I went to see glaciers in Argentina. And then I wanted to create my own uh, healthcare investing fund. Uh, but then uh, Mr. Israel Mako approached me and offered me to be, become the CEO of BioLite. And I knew uh, Israel Mako from the past. Actually, Israel is a great uh, person. He used to be the CEO of Teva. I think he's the, probably the most senior uh, and the most experienced farm uh, and health care manager in Israel now. And he's currently my chairman in, in BioLite. So it was a great opportunity for me to join a, 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 an active fund. It took me some time to understand why BioLite is focusing on ophthalmology. But this is an interesting story because once I understood deeper what is ophthalmology, I, 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 I don't know yet a lot of things in ophthalmology, but in the two years of, uh, of BioLite, so I can certainly understand why for a small fund like uh, BioLite, it's good to focus on one area. And ophthalmology is a great space to focus in currently, especially in Israel. Because what you have in ophthalmology in the recent years, a lot of technologies are immigrating from the high tech into the healthcare. And as you know, Israel is very strong in uh, what we call the startup nation. And we are very strong in the high tech. So when you take the great uh, engineers and entrepreneurs that we have in the high tech and you give them projects in healthcare, usually the projects will uh, uh, create very good uh, uh, products and also in, uh, in, uh, in the pharma area we have great academic institutions and hospitals. So ophthalmology is a great space. It's a little bit under the radar of the larger funds in Israel and it's a, it's a niche that you can focus on and really create synergies between the portfolio companies. So I think in BioLite it's a great example of what we are doing. So we have uh, uh, companies in dealing with drugs in ophthalmology, with uh, diagnostics, with devices. So we look at it as, as, a, as an holistic uh, space. You mentioned in the introduction that BioLite is an actually a, a publicly traded VC, which is a, a unique uh, structure. You don't find it uh, too much. It creates a lot of opportunities because when we have the right opportunity in the good times in the market, not like uh, we are now, so we can always go to the, your investors and ask for uh, money. So it's an evergreen fund. You are not limited that you have to exit in uh, five or seven years like the uh, the classical VC, so it gives you uh, some kind of uh, flexibility. And also it uh, appeals to a lot of investors. They, they want their uh, uh, investment to be uh, to have more liquidity than in a private VC. So the combination of Israel, of Talmology, the experience, I think the, the management team in BioLife brings is Ryan Mako, the, my experience in assuming the early stage and with uh, uh, actually a real revenue company and with uh, the scientific advisory board that uh, we created here and the board members that we have in Bioza, I think we are uh, positioned well to capture the opportunities in ophthalmology in, in Israel. So this is why I think in very brief um, comments about what we do in Bioza. So, I, you know, so that's great. Thank you. That was perfect. And I think uh, people will understand, you know, how you ended up here and have been given this responsibility or taken on this responsibility. There were a couple of things that you mentioned in your, in your background, which I think are important to focus on. Can you just spend a minute explaining what the tech transfer process is for you in Israel and why there is this, seems like there's a centralized organization responsible for tech transfer. Is that the case or is, how does that work? So, uh, you know, I always say that we have our day job and uh, I love uh, my extra hours that I don't really have, but to do some public calls. So when I was in the, uh, in Isum, most of the largest uh, universities in the world now have their tech transfer offices or companies in the Isum case. And so really, made, we had the uh, two drugs in the market, the Doxil and the Exxon on them. And, and, and so we had a very active tech transfer company, the famous Mobile I came for the Hebrew University and a lot of very successful uh, companies. So this was a single tech transfer company, but then I understood that the CEO of Isum, which was the most active tech transfer company that we are, we have also smaller and, and some other tech transfer companies in Israel that we should act as an organization. So it ha- helps us in uh, talking with the government about uh, some different uh, regulation, taxation, a few different aspects. So we created the organization. I was the chairman of the organization. We also are in some conferences. Now in BioLite, and uh, I'm jumping to another uh, topic, but it's relevant to this day. 
So I'm the co-chairman of an organization called IATI, which is Israeli Advanced Technology Industry. So this is an umbrella organization of all the high tech, most of the high tech and biotech companies. And this is again the same concept. So we are like representing the companies in what their needs uh, with the government, you know, we are exposing them to investors. And so we are like the representative organization of this company. And um, by the way, we have a, a very interesting conference this year in November in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, you will probably see the details online. But uh, the interesting thing is that uh, I think my role in Sumo, the tech transfer perspective, and uh, the company that I manage, and now the IPI, it gives me also a very nice overview of what you have in Israel in terms of uh, numbers and companies. And if I may, just to, to highlight for those of the, your listeners that are not aware, No, Israel is like, uh, we are a 9 million uh, people uh, uh, country, and I think the achievements are good. We, in the last decade, uh, there was about uh, 1,700 companies were established in the area of healthcare. About half of them are in the R&D stage, but uh, the other part are in the revenue stages. And uh, if you take uh, the, the split, so about uh, 140 are pharmaceutical companies, 700 are medical device companies, And digital health, we have close to 500 companies. So thinking about a relatively small community and so many startups. If you look at 2020, uh, we had about 200 companies raising money in this uh, area with uh, $11 million uh, average per deal. So we had a very vibrant uh, activity in the, this area. Specifically in ophthalmology, Uh, we have an interesting uh, WhatsApp forum of, of the CEOs of the ophthalmology companies. I think it's a unique situation that on a country level, all the CEOs of, in ophthalmology know each other and communicate and share uh, information. So I think it's an interesting environment to those of you who are not familiar. It's really, you know, it's a, some kind of a general uh, uh, friendship uh, that we share uh, information. And it's, uh, it's quite helpful in a lot of uh, aspects. So a long answer to a short question. Right. We, you know, we've had this conversation. I think a lot of people have had this conversation and, and on these podcasts, it's, it's come up with other, you know, CEOs of companies that are based in Israel, but there's something unique about the Israeli culture regarding the development of, of technology in general, but certainly as it applies to life sciences in that it is an extremely collaborative area. It, it, there is this constant communication between CEOs, as you've described, and as we've heard before. And there is there is a structure of organization like IATI and other entities that help to represent all of these companies, which is unique. It's a different environment where um, you have significant proximity between engineers, developers, healthcare experts, other technology experts, all in very close quarters working near each other. And that leads to a different level of interaction that I think helps propagate some of this technology, science, pharmaceutical develop a little bit faster and a little bit more evenly because you're all sort of surrounded by each other. Does that seem like a correct assessment? It's very much true to Israel. And just to emphasize it even more, you have to understand the size. So we are talking about all these companies and all the people that you mentioned We are all in the, the range of 120 miles from Haifa to Beersheba. So think about the Boston area. This is like the entire size of, uh, of the healthcare community in Israel. But, but I do want to add uh, some kind of uh, positive criticism about what you said about what is happening in Israel, which is unique. We have great engineers and we have great uh, scientists, but the nice thing is how to make them work together. So this is, I think, the, the advantage of groups like BioLite. I have this, uh, on, a, on an average week, I will see between one to two new companies, there are all these young uh, people coming with the shining eye that they believe that they have a $10 billion company and uh, we just don't understand this. And you see brilliant ideas, but I always tell them, show me the, the product that you will have at the end. Sometimes, you know, with all these engineering capabilities, they are running to do these crazy optical things with lasers and everything. And then you say, okay, show me what is 
the target product profile, you know, what show me the, what is there, then they get confused. So I always, I think that the role of uh, the organization and us in BioLab is to take these entrepreneurs and help them work in a structured way, take the best engineers relevant to the context, take the best scientists, combine them together, but have a vision of how the, the, the product will look like and uh, what, what should we spend uh, doing in R&D and what is not necessary for the first day. And I think that the combination of these brilliant minds and the engineering and the scientists, when you get them together with a clear business vision, I think you get the best results. Yeah, it's it's a very astute observation. Obviously, you live there, so you so you understand it much better than I do. But we see that a lot in on all startups, right? There's always this great vision of a, of a product and what it's going to do, but then a lot of uh, founder scientists, let's call them. Um, don't necessarily understand things like market potential, reimbursement, you know, whether or not a product is going to be accepted, what's the competitive landscape, all of the mm-hmm. things that we think we do well as venture investors, which you, and you do well as a venture investor at, at BioLite. So that's, I think, part of the role of the um, early investor um, as ve- in venture capital in whatever discipline is understanding the things that scientists often don't. Right, that's their their job is to create product. Your job is to figure out if the product is viable and where it fits in the market, and if it can be something that 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 the market will will embrace. So you're right, and you've got a lot of enthusiastic scientists because you've got unbelievable science there, and you must you know you've you've picked a portfolio. I know of nine companies, um, you know, which we'll talk about in a minute uh, in BioLite, which I think span a little bit of a spectrum across technology. Um, but yet there is some farmer representation in there as well. And we can talk a little bit about the portfolio in a minute. So it's interesting that, that you've, you've met the same challenges that we've met everywhere. I just, you know, I sort of feel like you have this, you know, the Technion, which you can probably spend a minute explaining to people because it's a fascinating environment at Technion and, and a lot of um, spin out science that comes out of the Technion, it ends up making its way into industry, which is fast, fascinating sort of incubator environment there. And some of the people and their training that 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 they get there, um, and then you you know put it into this economy where we have brilliant scientists, engineers, a collaborative environment in close proximity, and it sort of sounds like a sort of a perfect storm for for high tech development. I think that's why we're seeing so much come out of Israel, and so that's that's just my assessment. But I would say, Rob, it's more than that. It's not only the the tech. You know, we have a uh, good university also elsewhere, but it's definitely Tel Aviv University, the Weizmann Institute, that is uh, very high level. The university where I, I used to work, so they are all uh, top uh, institutions. But think about uh, I, I don't I don't think that uh, I have to repeat this, but in the classical uh, uh, lectures about what is special in Israel. Usually an Israeli student comes to the university after four or five years in the army, sometimes in special units, whether in the field or in, 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 in R&D areas, you know, these special, uh, you know, in which they do really amazing uh, things that you can see only in the movies. So when someone uh, works in the army, this crazy project for four or five years, so in, 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 you come to him with a uh, relatively easy to solve an optical problem or device, it sounds... Uh, like uh, very simple for you. So what's the big deal to, to print a 3D printing for to print the cornea if we if did a more uh, complex thing? So this is just an example. So now for all of this, why I, I use this uh, as an example. But but really people are doing uh, uh, amazing things in the army and then they, they try to implement it uh, in, the, in the industry after the army. So the combination of great academic the entrepreneurship spirit, the experience people are doing also from the army, I think creates a, a very uh, a active environment. And I always say it's not only the talents, it's the talents, it's the cost of developing. I, I sometimes see the, the budgets of uh, R&D that I see in, in US companies, the, the money they spend in the initial stages. I, I, I sometimes say that, uh, I, I would say that the, the dollar shekel exchange, so it's about the, uh, 25%. Uh, I, I, I would say that as a thumb wall, you can reach in a, with an Israeli startup to the same level of uh, early development of a product or a pharma with about uh, 25% of the of the money that you will usually spend on a, on a, on a, on a US startup. So it creates a, a, even a, a larger opportunity. So it's a combination of human resources, technological capabilities, 
great uh, research institutions and uh, the cost of uh, the funding. And another advantage, and this is also related to what you said in the beginning, we don't have too many VCs active in Israel. So unlike uh, the US, in which probably on the on a very good project, you will have a competition between the funds that they want to bring the startup uh, into their uh, VC in Israel. Uh, <laughs> This is not the case, so this is a great advantage of us being located in Israel because we really can capture the best actual ideas, at least in ophthalmology, you know the people, you know how to reach them, so we can get them in an early stage and help them with the advantages that is as I said, we bring to the data. And I think it uh, helped us to build a very nice uh, portfolio of content. Yep, I would agree. So let's talk a few minutes about about BioLite, particularly, you know, BioLite and InFocus are very similar, obviously, except that you're publicly traded and we're not. Um, but we have the same focus, which is identifying uh, disruptive and beneficial ophthalmic technology at an early stage in the hopes of propagating it into a viable product that is uh, accepted in the marketplace. So we have the same philosophy, and, and I know this because we've spoken you know, in, many times about, about the things that we like to invest in. And your portfolio is, is fantastic and, and contains some very exciting companies. So, and you and I have spoken about many of them, but I think there are a few that we should probably highlight here just so people get a, a sort of a flavor as to uh, what it is you do and what it is you're looking for. So why don't you start off with Diagnosed here? Because I think that's very interesting. We, we, we spoke about that, I think the last uh, Academy meeting we met. At in New Orleans, we spent some time talking about that, and I was able to see the product there as well. So, um, let's let's start with there. Talk a little bit about that, and then maybe go into some of the other companies. So, yeah, that was still is a great example of, of also of the model. Uh, so, Biolab, we are acting in two uh, in a hybrid model. The, the one, the, the main one, is that we take companies from let's say zero state. And we in, we are the so, the only investors in this company, and we build it until the, the, the time they get the partners. So I don't want to say an exit, but for a, for a significant partnering uh, event. So uh, we had a company like this called Ioptima that we already saw. It was the first uh, exit for uh, Biolite. And currently in our portfolio, we have uh, three main uh, portfolio companies like this, which is the Agnostic, uh, Biosite, and offer it, but let's touch uh, the atmosphere because it's a great example. So we have a, 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 a medical doctor that used to be a, a doctor in the army and he comes with this idea. We all know about the blood test, but I said, why we have blood tests when we don't have a tear test? We can learn a lot about the uh, different various eye diseases from the tears. So we said, okay, let's do what was done in blood tests and do it in a tear, but you have some problems. You have to collect the tears in a, a, in a in an easy way. You have to analyze it. You, do, you have to do it in before. You will not send it to the lab. So these were the things that uh, we are not to dealt with uh, uh, in the beginning. So before my time, uh, we developed a proprietary collector, very easy to use. You had the chance to experience it. Uh, and I demonstrated it to you. And then we are, uh, after we collected the tears, so we have this classical lateral flow assay that now we are all familiar with because of the COVID. And uh, what happens, the, uh, the know-how of uh, the atmosphere is the collector, is the special uh, uh, lateral flow assay that we put depending on the ingredient that we want to measure. And then Israel is the startup nation, so we added an act on a regular cellular phone that can read this lateral flow assay because it's semi quantity It's not only binary to have COVID or not, so it's also the amount of uh, air and we upload it to the cloud. So it's a closed loop system. Currently, our first indication is uh, for dry eye. So we are measuring six parameters to diagnose different aspects and to try to subtype the dry eye patients. We, are, we now have a, a very large uh, uh, clinical study uh, running in India, we had the studies in Israel and in the US. But now, and this is part of the Israeli culture, we are not uh, settled with only dry eyes. So we want to go to the next stage. So we want us to do virus or bacteria and allergy. And maybe we are asking ourselves, can we uh, maybe identify various retinal diseases from the tears? So if we manage to do this, I mean, this will be a, a real breakthrough. So 
Diagnostic is trying to change the way we think about diagnosis of front of the eye diseases. So we want to convert what we need to do with the blood test to a pill. And this was a company that you you identified at a very early stage and have helped in the management of, is that correct? Yeah, actually, it's the only company that sits in the way in our offices in, uh, in BioLife from the inception, and we really believe in it. Uh, we have a strategic investor there that uh, is also going to be the uh, manufacturer of uh, the kits together with our German manufacturer. So uh, we are ready. I mean, we hope that we will change the way uh, a, a classical ophthalmologist treats the patient. If someone walks in with a dry eye or a red eye or other diseases, we hope that in the next uh, years, our uh, it will become the standard of care. So, that, so that's fascinating. I think it's I think it's important to spend a minute just to discuss the financial relationship and how it works because you are a publicly traded entity, but yet these companies need funding from other sources, correct? So they're able to just because you are an investor in a company doesn't mean that a company can't go out and raise capital in other ways, right? So, you just become an investor. Biolite becomes so, the investor like so anybody this, else. This is a great uh, point. So. The, the hybrid model, so we have these companies and we have the other model in which we invest as a VC. So we have companies like Tarsier, Sanopolis, Belkin, AI, in which we invested as a VC. And so there, you know, BioLite money is like others. So we all the 5 to 10%, we sit on the board. So it's a classical VC structure. And the, the fact that we are a public company doesn't have an impact apart from some issues with reporting that we have to report. In the diagnostic case, it's a little bit different because our uh, financial reports are consolidated because we hold the more than 80% in the diagnostic. So financially, the uh, the results of the diagnostic are included in BioLite results. And also we, we have to do a, a, a more detailed uh, reporting about the status of the diagnostic. But to your point, no limitation on raising more investors. The other way around, because we are a public company, I think you see a, the, a very high level of corporate governance in companies like Diagnostic that you usually will not find in a privately held company. So we'll see a very organized minutes and the financial statements and everything. So it's very easy to in, an investor to join a portfolio company of BioLab because everything is so well organized because we are a public company. So a lot of them. So I'm an investor, let's just say, and I say, you know, uh, Yaakov, I love BioLite, but I really like that diagnosed here. And I want to invest in diagnosed here. They can do that. You can choose to accept money for diagnosed here. But if somebody likes your portfolio, they can go on the Israeli stock exchange and buy stock in BioLite, correct? Yes. So if someone wants to invest specifically in the Agnostir, so it will be a private placement into the Agnostir, and obviously it will be a bigger size of investment, and it will be negotiated based on an investment agreement. If someone wants to invest in the entire portfolio, he can simply buy our public shares on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, and then he's exposed to the entire portfolio of BioLite on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, and he has liquidity for his shares. So which of the other companies in your portfolio are in a similar relationship to Diagnosed here? Because there are other companies in which you function more as the primary owner, manager, operator, financial supporter of. So what are the other companies that, that have that same relationship? So currently, apart from Diagnosed here that, as I said, sits in our offices, we also have a company called Visai, which is a short name for Visual Sciences. We are uh, developing there an implant that slowly releases, releases Latana post in the subconjunctiva area. We already had a great results in a phase one to A we did in the US, and we showed that we managed to maintain the IOP below 18 for uh, three months. We also developed a unique inserter for this, the implant. The thing that we are working on it now with respect to the Vice company is that during our business development efforts, we found out that one of the problems that uh, we were uh, uh, exposed to with the discussion with our KOLs and the investor is that in the, uh, in the current implant by Vice, I also have to take out the implant after three months. 
So now we are upgrading the concept by developing a biodegradable implant. So hopefully we will have the same uh, uh, slow release characteristics. And we strongly believe that once we will solve this issue of the slow release, uh, we will have a, a winning a product because it sits in a relatively safe area in the eye. And uh, we believe it will uh, dramatically benefit the glaucoma patients. One thing I would like to add is that uh, uh, one of the advantages of BioLite as a, pot, uh, as a holding company of several uh, uh, ophthalmology companies, we have a great scientific advisory board uh, supporting our thinking and strategic thinking based on different areas. So we have uh, Professor Ronald Levenstein for uh, retina, uh, we have uh, Joe Tauber for dry eye, we have Jeff Goldberg from Stanford, and just uh, today I spoke with uh, Vince Anido, he used to be the chairman and CEO of uh, ARI. And for example, in the, in the context of Vaisai, so we uh, use his advice specifically for Vaisai for uh, designing our next steps. Another company that we uh, almost own all the shares there is a company called Ophrx, Ophthalmic Rx. It's a drug delivery platform. That actually, it's a closed loop for me because I started this company when I was the CEO of Isum in collaboration with Biolite. I didn't know then that I will become the CEO of Biolite. So we are using a, a, a special drug delivery a, a nanostructure of Professor Nissim Garty from the Hebrew University. And the original concept was to take the eye drops and get the active ingredients to the back of the eye. And we still yet to be proven, it's an early stage, but what we do have, we are currently launching a clinical study with a very high dose of cyclosporin. So if the restasis is 0.05 in its concentration, we are doing like now a 0.5% concentration. So it's 10 times more than the restasis. And the current study in the Sharet Sadek Hospital in Jerusalem, we want to show that we managed to uh, uh, administer to the eye 10 times more of the active ingredient, having the same safety profile in terms of the sensation of the air of the patient. And this again, it is, this, is, this is a proof of the concept of the advantages of the technology of the drug delivery platform of Ophorex. Another model that we did for the first time, we invested in a company that is originated from the Stanford University researcher by the name of Professor Jeff Goldberg. And he actually invented an idea of measuring the peripheral vision of a patient with a regular laptop like I'm using now with the integrated camera. And this is done in a collaboration with a startup in Israel called UMove. The company is called Peripherex. And we now hold almost 20%, but we uh, ask for the right and the option to buy 50% of the company. So we had very nice results in the Share Tzedek Hospital in, in Jerusalem, comparing the results of our laptop to the size, the Humphrey uh, uh, device. And we were very encouraged by the results. We will be uh, placing these devices in the hands of KOLs in the US in the coming months. The concept is to have in the clinics and hopefully also in the home monitoring that the patient will be able to measure its own, his own or her own uh, uh, peripheral vision. And we can see the trend if it's in, improving or getting uh, worse. We think that it's a great uh, uh, contribution to the uh, peripheral, especially the glaucoma patient. And we are very excited about uh, this opportunity. And as I said, it's a, uh, it's a new model that we started. So we take 20% and then we can grow along the years. It's great. It gives, you know, I think it's interesting being a publicly traded VC. I think you have a lot of flexibility with regard to how you sort of invest in companies and you have a lot of options with regard to, um, you know, what, what you want to do based on, I guess, stage of the company, valuation, all the other things that we consider. You can either be a passive investor or an active manager. And it's, it's, it's a nice, um, it's a nice flexible pattern for you, despite the fact that you're publicly traded. I think your access to capital sort of gives you the leverage to do that, um, which is unique. What's next? What is BioLite going to do? What are you guys thinking is your, you know, you've got these nine companies, they're all going to exit successfully, right? That's the, that's the goal. 
And, uh, you know, how do you continue to be active in the space? What's the future of, of, of BioLite with regard to its, its place in the ophthalmology investing world? Great. So first of all, uh, Rob, as you know, as a VC and an investor in ophthalmology, so uh, one of our goals is to help and support the nine companies that we have in our portfolio and to get them to the partnering or exit uh, uh, point. So this is uh, obviously uh, one of our goals. But in addition to this, we have now uh, two dreams. So the, the, the first one is uh, with the help of our internal uh, chief medical officer, uh, Dr. Ron Neumann. So we actually completed scouting of all the Israeli universities and hospitals to find what will be the next uh, big thing in the area of new drugs in ophthalmology. And I think we identified some very exciting candidates with great research teams and uh, we are an early stage uh, investment uh, uh, VC, so we will uh, invest in these uh, drug candidates in the first stages, hopefully taking them to the proof of concept in humans. These are exciting projects, and in the next uh, uh, months, I'm sure that we will uh, uh, do some PRs about it, and we will be able to know about them. The second one is a bit of a larger one. And uh, when you look at the Israeli advantages, as I said before in, uh, in this nice podcast, so the Israelis are very good in the entrepreneurship and engineering, but sometimes we fail in the uh, really understanding the, the US reimbursement, the European reimbursement and what the market really needs. And this is a great value that uh, US companies bring to the table. So one of my dreams now in uh, BioLife, because we are a VC active in Israel, is to, to collaborate with investors and groups of investors like you, for example, in, in focus of uh, another uh, fund in the US that is focusing on ophthalmology. And I think it's a collaboration between a US uh, fund investing in ophthalmology with uh, a, an Israeli group like ours investing in ophthalmology can create a great uh, win for both uh, sides because we are here, we are the, the boots on the ground, we find the best entrepreneurs, we help to develop the, the, prod the product to a certain stage and with the knowledge of people like you and uh, your, your fund and, and other funds that are investing in ophthalmology that understand the US market and the reimbursement, this can be a great combination and I, I hope that uh, in the near future, we will establish uh, such kind of a collaboration. And I think it will be a great thing also for the ophthalmology uh, companies in Israel. I think with that, we're going to sort of wind down a little bit, but it's exciting to hear. I mean, I, I think that, you know, it's always fascinated me. The, your, your financial structure has always been exciting. I think that the portfolio um, and the quality of your assets is, is exceptional. And we certainly um, appreciate um, the fact that you've continued to support ophthalmology inside of Israel. And I'm sure that uh, with the success that you're going to see with many of the companies, hopefully all of them in your portfolio, they'll be able to expand beyond your borders in, in whatever way you feel is, is best for your investors. So um, it's a great model and I think you've done a great job building it. And again, it's a, it's a, it's a pleasure to interact with you on, you know, a podcast and even more so out in the finance world. So um, you know, having said that, um, I want to thank you for today, uh, for the time you spent explaining um, BioLite and your portfolio to some degree to the audience, and I'm hoping we get to do this in person again soon. Um, and certainly looking forward to the IATI conference in November, where, as you know, I hope to be able to you know be be in person. So we'll we'll keep working on that as well. So uh, thank you very much for hosting me here. And uh, let's uh, remember our main goal to bring uh, better drugs and additional drugs and technology for uh, the patients. And uh, looking forward to see you and uh, all of you in Israel and in the conferences. And uh, let's uh, do good things together. Thanks again, Yaakov. Um, and thanks again to the OIS podcast audience. Looking forward to speaking with you again soon. Thank you for listening, everyone. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the OIS podcast. Be sure to listen in next week as we discuss the latest innovations in ophthalmology with experts in science, medicine, and industry. Subscribe to our iTunes channel so you don't miss a thing. 
Got a story of your own to tell? Apply to be a guest at ois.net. <laughs>